friends, I am Umesh here and I am a solopreneur from India and today in this video I am going to show you a brief explanation about the Bitcoins uh, by the man himself, uh, Mr. Sandeep Goenka from India who is the co-founder and CEO, uh, COO of the Zeppe. Uh, he will explain you each and everything in detail. In so after, after watching this video, if you think that you have to work in the Bitcoins, so you can contact me anytime here by uh, clicking on my contact page here you can contact me from youtube facebook or you can send me direct message and i will help you to uh, set up your bitcoin business uh, online right and uh, you and this is my facebook profile you can meet me here also right and i am as uh, already working in the bit kingdom community uh, which works on the bitcoins as you can see here right so if you want to join with me after watching this uh, whole presentation you can join on my link uh, which i have given in the description below okay so make sure to watch the full video and understand the working of the bitcoins. Thank you. Please watch the video now. Good evening, everyone. Lots of uh, friends and family in the audience. A big warm welcome. Uh, warm welcome to a chief guest, Anar Ben. I was actually in her office to invite her yesterday and she asked me so many questions about bitcoins. I was pretty surprised that I ended up giving her the entire presentation yesterday. Anar Ben, I hope you don't get bored now. <laughs> Now we come across a lot of uh, new technology every day, you know, things and which changes our behavior. But once in a while, we come across something that changes everything. It changes the very fabric of society. Today's event is dedicated to one such mega change that is looming just around the corner. A change in our money. So why is it important for all of us sitting over here to understand this change? Well, just like those who anticipated the changes brought about by the industrial revolution and then the information and the technology revolution were able to tremendously benefit from it. Similarly, those of us who would anticipate and predict this change can benefit from it or at the mini minimum take control of one of the most important and hard-earned things that you have, your money. So the first thing that I want to touch upon is why do we need money? Well, we need money for one and only one thing to solve the problem of barter. From that point of view, money is nothing else but a technological solution to solve a problem that society faces. The next thing that I want to touch upon is what thing do we use as money and really why? So around 11,000 years back, that is in 9,000 BC, the first thing that society or people started using as money was day-to-day -day utilities or commodities like grain or cattle or uh, beads or seashells, whatever was available in nature but was still scarce. So you would not use rocks or sand because there was abundance of it. It had to be precious. It had to be a little rare. But this kind of money, these commodities were difficult to use as money. They had problems with durability. Grain could get spoiled. Cattle could die. There goes your money. It had problems with portability. It was difficult to move it from one place to the other. You know, drag your cow along when you have to pay someone. It had problems with divisibility. I mean, imagine if your tribe is accepting money, uh, which is cattle, and you want to make a small transaction, then you can understand the challenges. Then after about 5,000 years, that is around 4,000 BC, precious metal started being used. And that happened when different tribes wanted to kind of transact with each other. And suddenly everybody started precious, accepting precious metals, you know, because one tribe would use beads and the other one would use cattle. And then precious metals emerged as this global currency. And that happened because, of course, precious metals were rare. But it also happened because precious metals were better than the previous thing that society was using as money, like grain or cattle. They were more durable, more easily portable, and more divisible, more easily divisible. You could just heat up precious metal, liquefy it, break it into parts, so you could use it for smaller transactions. Then just 1,000 years back, paper money was born. Now this happened when people who had gold started depositing their precious metal, their gold, with goldsmiths, mainly to prevent theft at home. And the goldsmiths became bankers and they started issuing paper receipts, you know, in exchange of deposit as a proof. And that's how currency note was born. And over a period of time, what happened was, rather than physically exchanging gold, people started exchanging these paper receipts because they found it a lot more convenient. You know, just go back to the goldsmith, get your gold, then pay someone, just give the paper receipt, you know, and that person would accept it. In fact, before 1918, you know, this is just less than 100 years back, I'm sure not many of you know that, there were more than 5,000 different banknotes in circulation in the US alone. If you look closely, each US dollar bill 
was issued by a different bank. And you could actually take one of these currency notes back to the Ishwik bank and exchange it for a fixed amount of precious metal like silver or gold. This kind of money that people were using before 1918 were, as experts call, backed by the gold standard. Fast forward to what we currently use as money. What happened over the last 100 years, okay, just 100 years, that country after country, nation after nation exited the gold standard. The money that we now use is as experts call fiat money. And if you look up the word fiat in dictionary, fiat means something that has no intrinsic value. The only reason it has value is because some central authority says so, and we as a society accept that. So contrary to popular belief, the current thing that we use as money is fiat money not backed by the gold standard and is less than 100 years old. So let's see if there, is a, if there is any scope for improvement in the current thing that we use as money, you know, fiat money. So the first thing that I want to talk about is portability. Now until recently, money was extremely physical in nature. If I had to make a transaction, I would physically give you money. And because money itself would move from me to you, we would not need a third party to confirm this transaction. But in the last few decades, we increasingly transfer money over electronic networks. Now with electronic money, there is a problem because the money does not physically move from me to you. We both need to trust a third party gatekeeper like a bank or a credit card company or a, or a clearing house, which we both trust who oversees and authorizes that yes, this transaction happened and confirms the transaction by making a note in their ledger, just in case one of us disputes the transaction. Now what has happened is because most of money is being transferred over these electronic networks over the last few decades, these electronic network companies have become extremely powerful. They have the right to uh, you know, not allow certain people of the society from accessing their network. For example, if you are poor, a bank will not open your bank account. If you do not have a good credit card rating, a credit card company will not give you a credit card. So they are extremely powerful. They can you know, actually disallow you from using the network. And in fact, in an extreme case, they can in fact disallow a transaction on their network. So just think about it, for the first time in the history of money, even if it's your money, the only way you can use electronic money is as permissible by these electronic networks. That was never the case with physical money, all right? So there is a scope that money, of course, should be electronic so that you can move it over the electronic network instantly, but you should also have the right to use it the way you want it without giving your privacy and your de details for every purchase that you made, which in many cases gets, gets misused. The second thing that I want to talk about is that we're increasingly global citizens, especially because we are using a global information and data network like the internet. But our currencies are extremely national in nature, which makes it very easy for us to transact people from within the same country, but makes it extremely difficult to transact with people outside the country. And even when you can do that, I mean, if, if you're among the lucky few who has an international credit card or an overseas bank account, even when you do that, you have to pay a tax, a kind of a fee to these money exchangers. Now, this can vary anywhere between half a percent if you're a large corporate or you want to do a large transaction to anywhere more than 15% if you're a simple worker in Dubai who wants to send money back home to your family every month. So obviously, there is a scope for improvement, especially considering the fact that as a global economy, we exchanged more than 6 trillion US dollars a day, every day last year, a figure which is growing by more than 20%. So there's a scope for having a global currency for increasingly global citizens. The third thing that I want to touch upon is that the money that we currently use, fiat money, is susceptible to hyperinflation. Now what is that? Fiat money for the first time is basically unlimited in supply and free to create. The only way its supply is created, it's made rare, is artificially by the central bank and the government of the nation by, use, by their monetary policy. But once in a while, sometimes for good reasons and sometimes for bad reasons, the government needs to create a lot of money, maybe to fund a war or to kickstart an economy from depression. And sometimes when the elections are coming for populist measures, now, when that happens, for no fault of ours, our my existing money loses value, and that's called, that's called inflation. And when it happens in a dramatic way over a very short period of time, it's called hyperinflation. With fiat money, which is only 100 years old, there have already been more than 55 cases of hyperinflation in the last 100 years. Some of the more interesting ones have been in 2008, the Zimbabwe dollar was losing half its value. 
every 25 hours. In fact, at one point of time, the Zimbabwe dollar, you can just use it as toilet paper. 100 billion of them could buy you three eggs. Very recently, that's just in 2014, end of 2014, the Russian ruble, I mean, imagine the size of the Russian economy. The ruble lost 40% of its value in a very short period of time. In fact, on one day in mid-December, it lost 19% of its value. That's hyperinflation. And we all know about the Asian financial crisis, which in 1997, the national currencies of all uh, nations lost a dramatic amount of, its, uh, of, of, of their value in a very short period of time. So the thing that we use as money, like previous times, should be resistant to hyperinflation so that the purchasing power of the money that we already have is protected. In Jan 2009, an anonymous person by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto invented what is widely acclaimed to be as big as the invention as the internet itself, if not bigger. He invented, any guesses? <laughs> Bitcoins. So let me explain why Bitcoin is the best kind of money, better than any previous form of money. The first thing, Bitcoin is the first kind of money which has the benefits of both electronic and physical money. Just like electronic money, you can instantly transfer Bitcoins from anywhere to anywhere in the world over the internet. But like physical money, you do not need for a Bitcoin transaction a third party gatekeeper. And that's because of the brilliant technology at the back end, which means with Bitcoins, even though it's electronic and it's digital, you have the right to spend it without giving your data, without giving your privacy and without allowing anybody else to tell you whether that transaction can happen or no. Which means that even if though it, it could be economically unviable for banks to open branches in, you know, maybe underprivileged sections of the society, if a villager needs to open a Bitcoin account, which is called a wallet, all he needs is a smartphone. And he can open a Bitcoin account within seconds. And then he has the power of an international credit card and an overseas bank account and can pay, and can pay anyone in the world with the palm of his hands. Bitcoin truly has the potential to leapfrog and bank the unbanked, especially in developing countries. Second, Bitcoin is a global currency. Now, Bitcoin's backend technology is something similar to the internet, all right, which means no country, company, or organization owns it, which means as a country, no country should have a problem in accepting Bitcoins as a form of currency as a form of global currency or as a payment method because they do not have to depend upon a rival country like the way we depend upon the US dollar right now. And in fact, in today's paper, you know, they're talking about the US Fed taking some decisions which could create problems over here. We don't have to depend upon that with Bitcoin because no country controls it. It also means that since no one controls it, no one can shut it down, just like the way no one can shut down the internet. Even if you ban it, you cannot shut it down, which means Bitcoin is robust and it's truly global. The third thing, any form of money in history needs to be precious and rare. Bitcoin software makes sure that Bitcoin is rare as well, which means there will only be 21 million Bitcoins that will ever be created by the Bitcoin network. 13 million of them have already been created. And so as the supply is fixed and the demand keeps increasing, the price of Bitcoin will go up just like the way it has in the past, which means Bitcoin is resistant to inflation or other hyperinflation, just like the way precious metals are. So people confuse this, you know, when I say that only 21 million Bitcoins are going to be created, people confuse is that, I mean, 21 million and then there are billions of people in the world. So, I mean, how will there be enough Bitcoins for circulation, right? Very valid question. Well, let me explain. Just like if the value of gold would be less and I had to do a transaction, I would exchange kilograms of gold, right? But as the value of gold goes up, you start using grams and milligrams and so on and so forth. You know, but gold is physical, so you cannot really divide them into atoms and molecules. But Bitcoin is nothing else but a number. It's an electronic token, it's a number, which means it's infinitely divisible. In fact, already a Bitcoin is divisible up to the eighth decimal, not like the second decimal, which, is, which we are used to with national currencies, up to the eighth decimal, which is fondly called a Satoshi, named after the founder. Which means when you own one Bitcoin, you, can, you actually own 100 million Satoshi. So don't worry, there will always be enough Bitcoins for circulation. So now that you've had a brief introduction about Bitcoin, so what? Nobody really uses Bitcoins, you know, so why should you bother? Let's check the assumption that nobody really uses Bitcoins. So Bitcoin's trading volume and Bitcoin exchanges worldwide touched $23 billion at the end of 2014, a jump of 50% over the year before. 
VC investment in Bitcoin companies is pouring in, touching half a billion dollars. One of the world's largest banks, Citibanks, ex-CEO, not some top manager, ex-CEO and the New York Stock Exchange investing $75 million in a Bitcoin company, Vikram Pandit. Vikram Pandit goes on to say that Bitcoin has the potential to change the world. You can imagine what the future of banking will look like. Most recently, on 10th March, just less than two weeks back, do you know about PayPal, one of the world's largest payment companies? The founders of PayPal, eBay, Expedia, and a lot of other influential people investing $116 million in a Bitcoin startup. This just happened two weeks back. Billion dollar companies are already accepting Bitcoins, especially in the US. The most recent and the biggest being Microsoft, which accepts Bitcoins on its US website for Xbox points. Small and medium-sized merchants are not far behind. More than 60,000 merchants now accept Bitcoins worldwide, a number which is expected to touch one and a half lakh merchants by the end of this year. Transactions per day on the Bitcoin network, which was next to zero just a couple of years back, has crossed 100,000 transactions at the end of 2014. Bitcoin accounts, which are called wallets, again next to zero a couple of years back, touching 8 million wallets. And Bitcoin ATMs are springing up worldwide. Bitcoin, Bitcoin ATM is just like your regular ATM where you can walk up, transfer Bitcoins from your smartphone and get local cash. Three, more than 320 at last count. And Bitcoin is legal, contrary to popular belief. But I'll leave this for our next celebrity speaker, Nishit Bhai, to talk about it. And so what do other people are thinking about Bitcoins? The chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of India says that virtual currencies hold long-term promise. Richard Branson has compared it, has said that it's a bold technology. Eric Schmidt, CEO of Google, has called it a remarkable achievement. Peter Thiel, founder of PayPal, says that Bitcoin is the first kind of money that has the potential to change the world. Bill Gates has called Bitcoins a technological tour the force. And Leon Louv, a Nobel Peace Prize nominee, said that every informed person should know about Bitcoins because it just might be the most important development in the world. So let's come to the most interesting aspect of Bitcoins, its price. And that's the price of Bitcoins from the beginning till recent times. And when somebody new gets, looks at this graph and he says, I mean, can't you see Bitcoin had its heydays last year and it's dying now. It's time to run away. Well, not so soon. What I've done is I've divided this graph into what I call as previous boom cycles. So let's zoom in to the first boom cycle, which is just the second year of Bitcoin in 2010. And when you zoom into this boom cycle one, this flat line actually looks a little bit like this. So in 2010, just the second year of Bitcoin, which I call the boom cycle one, Bitcoin's price went from just a couple of cents, negligible, to 39 cents and then crashed to 19 cents. Can you imagine what the people who got involved in Bitcoin just at that time said? Bitcoin is dying, can't you see? But not so soon. Because next year from 19 cents, Bitcoin crossed dollar parity. This is just the third year of its existence and touched $28. But then again crashed to $2, giving the skeptics another reason to shout Bitcoin is dead. From $2 in 2012, 2013, Bitcoin touched a whopping $230 and crashed to $66. And then it's from $66 in 2014, in a couple of months, Bitcoin crossed $1,150. After that, crashing to around $180 a couple of months back. And today's price is around $250 to $300. It's kind of on an upward trend. Maybe a good time to buy. So the skeptics were shouting that Bitcoin is dead at 19 cents and then $2 and then $66 and then $180. We've heard it before. But the Bitcoin believers whom we fondly call as Bitcoiners are not complaining. Anyways, Bitcoin is covered by Western media a lot. It's covered by CNN Money, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg. And I can assure you that we are making efforts at Zeppe that it gets the same kind of coverage in India as well. And if you want to check the price of a Bitcoin, you can check it just the way you can check the price of any national currency at all popular websites like Google, CNN, Bloomberg. So right, you're hopping onto the Bitcoin jet, I hope. So what next? 
how do you get started? Bitcoin has a bit of a learning curve, but if you're new to Bitcoins and you want to use Bitcoins, so or Bitcoins are linked with your mobile number, so hopefully you don't have to worry about hacking and losing your Bitcoins just like the way you read it in the news. And you can send and receive Bitcoins to anyone in the world. If you want to send Bitcoins to your brother or your uh, family back home, you more importantly, keep a lookout, of, lookout for Bitcoins. Thanks a lot for your interest. Thank you.